For the longest time, I secretly wanted more. I often found myself shrinking to fit in, settling for what was comfortable, and even selling myself short. Once I finally accepted that we deserve success and we are blessed with the power to achieve it, I stopped playing small. I'm serious about building a life I love and you should be too. I'm Denise Taylor of DeniseTaylor.live and welcome to Life, Love, and the Pursuit of Happiness. I help women prioritize themselves, their success, and their happiness. Let's meet this week's achiever whose story will inspire you to push past your fears and soar. Hey, it's Denise, and I am so glad to just peek in with you and welcome you to this episode of Life, Love, and the Pursuit of Happiness. This is a special episode featuring an interview that I did at my recent DeniseTaylor.live virtual event. I was so elated to welcome the McAndrews. They talked about that hot topic that many couples struggle with, can we get on the same page? The wisdom that comes from growing together and creating that interdependence on one another is what spawns intimacy beyond the bedroom. So let's listen into this great conversation. Get some nuggets of wisdom on how to grow in love. All right. Well, welcome. Um, like I've been saying to the other guests before you, you are on a train in motion. We have had a fantastic week, but I have been looking forward to our conversation because we are all in this same boat together. Amen. You know, really trying to get on the same page in any relationship requires certain skills, certain patience, and requires us to give one another grace. But when you do it in a marriage relationship, those close quarters some can sometimes make things difficult. And so I don't think you ever arrive. I know you guys are approaching a good milestone in your relationship and we have two and we're still working at it. So I don't want you to feel like you have to be experts today. We're just having a conversation so that we can help other people, one, realize that they are not alone because that is the biggest, 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 uh, biggest misconception mm -hmm. when you are facing difficulty in any relationship is that you you are alone. If right. you haven't guessed it, we're talking about being better together. And I have my beautiful guest tonight, the wonderful McAndrews with the infectious smiles. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here um, and being available to have this conversation with me. Now, some people have asked about replays and I've got a plan for that. So if you've missed something, you'll have a chance to take it all in. But tonight I wanna talk to this lovely couple and unpack more about growing interdependently with one another. And that means getting more intimate outside of the bedroom, okay? All right, so Matt, do me a favor. Do the honors of introducing your beautiful wife to me and everyone listening in. For sure. Uh, I'll certainly do that. I want to first say thank you so much for having us on. Uh, we love you. We appreciate you. Aww. You're a boss and your background is super dope. I like this painting. <laughs> that's going on here. Um, but the uh, incredible lady to my right, uh, your left, I'm not sure if it works that way when you're on Zoom, uh, is Dorothy Adair Barney McAndrew. Um, the most <laughs> Irish name that you'll ever hear in your <laughs> And um, she is, uh, uh, we met a long time ago, and uh, she is the mother to our two incredible boys. She is the director of our church's e-academy, our uh, child care for all of our staff, um, and she's a boss at that. And um, she's the owner of the most impeccable mind I've ever had the pleasure of encountering, and I get to sit next to her and um, just try my very best to not... Um, I don't know, just not become a spectator to hear what she has to say today. Oh, so. <laughs> that is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing and doing such an excellent job introducing your beautiful wife. I didn't know that um, she served in that leadership capacity, molding and shaping the young minds that come across her path. That's beautiful. All right, Adair. I don't know why he went to Dorothy, but we're going to stick with Adair tonight. Okay. <laughs> 
but we, um, do me the honors of introducing your handsome husband. So this is Matt McAndrew. He is the associate campus pastor of the best campus of Elevation Church, That's Elevation right. University City. Mm -hmm. um, but before that, he was the twin brother of, I don't know if anybody knows that he's a twin. Um, we met in ministry school. Um, he's always had a huge heart for the gospel, huge heart for people. He's one of the most authentic, almost to a fault, authentic people I know. For sure. I'm always wondering what's going to come out of his mouth because he just does not hold back. Um, he assumes the best about people also sometimes to a fault where I'm like, can you not see that they are <laughs> not to be trusted? A psychopathic murderer. Things but like that. he will always assume the best about people. And it's one of my most favorite qualities about him. So that's beautiful. How lovely is that? You know, I was looking and I saw your Valentine's post and that gave me some insight <laughs> into how the two of you actually came together and your love started to blossom. It was so nice to see you celebrate your relationship in that way and um, just let good of the goodies, like that <laughs> first kiss behind the apartment building and who said I love you first and all of those cute little things. Uh, that make our relationship special and give us great memories. So I found that to be fun and cute. So Matt, beyond that, help us understand when did you know it was love and when did you know you wanted to spend the rest of your life with Adair? Yeah, I, I think it was such, um, we had very interesting kind of connecting starting meeting points. We met at a ministry school in Columbia, South Carolina, and part of the ministry, it was like an intense discipleship program. So like part of the whole first year was like, you're not going to have any relationships with the opposite sex. Like you're not even going to really like talk. The not language they used was like, it's a fast, mm -hmm. like you're fasting, you're, you're fasting from this, from needing the attention of the opposite gender. Right. And, and ultimately needless to say, both of us actually needed it. That's one of the parts of the program that I was most excited for because yeah. we were thirsty. Let's just be honest. We were both, we were both very <laughs> thirsty separately. Um, and so like, I really like that whole first year we were together, but we weren't like together and it, I, we weren't looking like the whole point mm -hmm. was to not, and it wasn't until the next year where we were serving kind of in ministry together. We were singing on the worship team together. Like we went on a mission trip to Ecuador together um, and really started being like, okay, I started noticing this person. I, I, I'll, I'll say this. I have a, a particular like image in my mind mm -hmm. uh, of, of her sitting on like this deck out front of uh, one of our classrooms mm -hmm. with a Mountain Dew slushy from a 7-Eleven mm -hmm. um, with this like this like loose polo on or her blonde hair back and she just had the straw in the corner of her mouth and I'm like in that moment I was like okay this girl <laughs> this girl is like she is, she is fine and I but I think that that love moment that thing that was like hey like this could be like perpetual this could be forever we had um as a part of the program in that year we still there still was this intentional friendship and thing that they wanted to kind of cringy to it's kind of cringy now, to think about but... now we've been married 10 years and several kids but it was like um we wound up sitting in her uh camry in the parking lot of that same apartment complex that you were referring to for four hours or something just talking about life talking about is this like can we be what is more this? than what we Can we are? be more than this? Can we not? And I think walking out of that was like, I mean, she was like, okay, this could be something. And I was like, all right, this is going to be my wife. We're just going to, we're going to slow roll it, but she, she's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be it. That is beautiful. Well, as you mentioned, you guys are coming up on a great milestone. 10 is a huge marker in a relationship. So make sure you do something special to celebrate, even under our circumstances, figure out how to pull out all the stops and go all in. That's a phenomenal accomplishment. I remember when we reached 10 years, I kind of felt like, you know, it's almost like when you're a kid and you get to double digits and you're like, I'm double digits now, you yes, know, sure. um, <laughs> it had that, had that bit of sensation when we reached that mile marker um, in our relationships. But I want you guys to take a couple minutes and do a little reflection and think back, you know, about the 10 years and what do you cherish most when you think of your time together as man and wife, what do you think of? What do you cherish? Um, 
I will say that I think everybody experiences part of growing up and you don't turn 18 and now you're grown, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, your brain, our brains aren't fully developed until we're like 25. Mm -hmm. So we got married at 21. Mm -hmm. So we were children Mm -hmm. and basically we didn't know what we were doing. Right. And so I think for me, the process of even learning who I am as a person Mm -hmm. and having a safe person to do that with, to process. And of course, as you, there's always going to be hard seasons and you're going to bump into stuff that might bring up like childhood trauma and just stuff, the stuff that we all carry that we might not even know that we're carrying until we're older and we start having our own children and experience bad bosses and, you know, friendships break off or whatever. And he, he and I, I think, I believe, I hope that I've created this for you, but you've definitely for me just been a safe place Mm -hmm. to, um, grow up really. And, um, you know, to be fully known by somebody and like still confident that I'm loved and and accepted is everything. So Mm -hmm. I think coming up on 10 years, that's what I would say. Like, it's the greatest gift to know that like he has my back and he has seen me at my lowest and at my worst and I can bring him anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, he's going to be a safe person that covers me. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Very beautiful. What about you, Matt? I mean, how to say it more eloquently than that? I'm I'm not sure, but uh, top that. <laughs> <laughs> so much for trying to be on the same team um, as we start off on a really good foot uh, in this in this moment. Um, We're work in progress. I, I I really I really think for me with that I think it really is I'm I'm very predisposed like to be very invested in my work to be very invested in ministry that's set in front of me to and and I remember being young and like probably having a, a, a misconstrued idea of uh, and a misalignment of priority and values as far as where my marriage is, where my relationship is and where my ministry is. And, um, and I felt like I probably held ministry and the work of the ministry at, at to a higher level of prestige or priority in my life than I did my relationship. Not, not to that I, I didn't value or I wouldn't if I had to just break with this thing to go do this, but Um, but it was, it was, it was tough. And I think just years of hard conversations and living in the trenches and those, those seasons that you go through the level of communication and understanding your emotions and yourself. And, um, I think just time has really taught me to cherish really just family and and time together and those memories that are made together, um, than anything else. And we've been a part of incredible launches of campuses and huge events and huge ministry moments, which I, I are unbelievable, but they really, when I really think back pale in comparison to the, some of the memories and the moments that we've been able to have together mm-hmm. across the 10 years in the midst of all that, because after that happens at church and we have 500 kids show up for the event and there's a hundred that make decisions for Christ and all that, I come home mm-hmm. and she's the constant and has always been the constant and the person that's just there having she, to her point, having somebody that's just in your corner mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. is, is, is just beyond value to me. So it's huge. Yeah, that, that, that really is huge. And, and I'll tell you what I appreciate is the example that you exhibit. So I get to blow up your text a lot, right? <laughs> and there are times when I text you and you'll say, hey, I was away from the phone because I'm focused on family. Or, hey, I didn't respond to you because I was away for the weekend. And I think that intentionality of just saying, you know what, this electronic device, though it's important and there's a lot of really great things that are happening on it. It's something that you have shown me an example of just putting it to the side and coming back later and acknowledging like, yeah, I didn't get right back to you, but I'm here now and let me answer your question. And it sounds like it was a journey for you to get there. And that intentionality is something that I'm sure that she appreciates because I definitely see it as an example. And I, of course, I don't feel turned off. You know, I got a lot going on myself, but at the same time, I can recognize you really putting in the effort to say you 
have my attention. I am here with you and I am shutting out the rest of everything that is going on. So nothing takes away from that. So I just want to commend you for that because a lot of people have a hard time walking away. That thing is like a leash on many people. And so that example is powerful. Yeah, you're winning me a lot of points right now. And and don't, <laughs> I want everybody that's watching to not hear like, I do not have that perfect. I have definitely progressed a huge, there's been ups and downs, but overall we're up and to the right and trying to get better at that. But there certainly have been seasons where it's been, you know, and, and, and it's not even just seasons. There are days where, you know, like not to think like, well, that was a far season. Like probably, probably within the last couple of weeks, you know, like, can you go ahead and stop? So it's, I wish I could say I was without error, without flaw, but, um, but it he just has gotten so much better. In fact, I have a funny, really quick story. I will never forget. We were on a date night and it was back in 2019. We were doing weekly date nights, which we might talk about later. Mm-hmm. And it was just a commitment we made to each other. And so we were on a date night and his boss, Chet texts him and was like, Hey, can you hop on the phone really fast? And we were literally just in the car on the way to dinner. And he, he wasn't going to do it because he was like, no, I'm here with you. And I was like, well, it's, I mean, that's kind of odd that he's, you know, wanting to talk to you this late at night. It might be an emergency or important. And it turns out I had to like tell him, no, take the call. Like, it's okay. Mm-hmm. It turns out he was communicating about some very good news mm-hmm. about his job. I'll just say that. Mm-hmm. And we were able to turn it into like a celebratory thing. Mm-hmm. But it's just funny because that was not the case when we first got married. Mm-hmm. That is for sure. Nope. Yeah. And I, and I know that many couples struggle with that. And I think wh- whatever it is, and this is something that I used to say to Chuck all the time. And honestly, it took us years to get there, get to the point where I think he was really understanding what I was saying in me in return. I used to say, if it's important to me, then it needs to be important to you. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what I would kind of say to him because, you know, we all grow up different. We all have different experiences. We have different values, so on and so forth. But if it's important to me and you love me, right. And you're committed to me, then it needs to get in the top five. Like it may not take number one, but it needs to get in the top five. And what that tends to do for you is to feel valued in the relationship relationship, you know, to feel heard in the relationship, to feel understood in the relationship. And when you can make that switch, right, that's part of the whole coming together process that you guys have exhibited. And I think it was wonderful, Adair, that you said to him, hey, it's okay. You know, in this moment, I'm not going to hold it against you. It's okay. And I think that that partnership in that moment is a great example of how he wanted to honor you, but at the same time, you're like, hey, in this moment, I'm good with it, you know, take the call. Mm -hmm. And having that ability to have that communication is so huge, very, very huge. I I know you wanna go on, but can I just, early on, I remember, and I just saw that someone said that they're watching with their future husband Mm -hmm. remotely. And Mm -hmm. so I wanted to say this, when we first got married, again, we were really young, 21, but I can remember, I had all these expectations of him Mm -hmm. um, that he would just read my mind and know, like I wanted him to pursue me the same way that he pursued me when we were dating. Mm -hmm. And I wanted him to um, romance me and chase me the same way, but we were, we were newly married and we got pregnant very quickly, unexpectedly. And he was working his first big boy job. Mm -hmm. So he had all looking back, he had all this pressure to provide and to be a successful employee. And it was, he was full-time pastor at a church Mm -hmm. and there, it was just this perfect storm of me feeling like I was frustrated that he did, like, he should just know, Mm -hmm. he should know what's important to me. He should Mm -hmm. know that he needs to act X, Y, Z. Meanwhile, he's just doing all he knows to do, which is provide for his little brand new family. Mm -hmm. And there was just literally years of conflict of me not wanting him him being frustrated that I didn't communicate to him what I was wanting and hoping for and what my expectations were and me constantly being disappointed and let down Mm -hmm. because my needs weren't being met Mm -hmm. and it took honestly like I had to get over the idea that his love would reflect on how he could read my mind Mm -hmm. which is just not it was just an immature view of what love is like Mm -hmm. love is 
being able to dig deep and communicate what your needs are. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, it's not a big deal for me to be like, Hey, I'm feeling really disconnected. And I don't get mad at him if he's not feeling the same way, you know, and I have to bring it to his attention. Mm -hmm. Whereas early on in our, in our first couple of years of marriage, I would have been mad that he didn't recognize that we were disconnected, yeah. you know? Yeah. Those, those, um, on Monday night, there was someone who brought up hidden contract, right? It's a contract that you have going on with him, but he doesn't even know he's entered he's into it with you. Like you have no idea that I am waiting on you to figure out what is wrong with me. Right. And so, um, the communication element of that is important, but it makes us tap into our vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And that is where it gets difficult is when we've got to be honest honest with ourselves, like you said, and say, you know what, I'm feeling a little low right now. I'm feeling a little needy right now. I need you to give me some attention. I need you to give me some focus and be willing to have that conversation um, in an expression of what our needs truly are. Yeah. Awesome. You know, in our promo video that we recorded a couple of weeks ago for tonight, you guys actually said something that stuck out to me. And you mentioned that a mentor brought it to your attention that he could sense that the two of you were being competitive. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really interesting because a lot of people don't see it that way. And I think it's powerful that you had someone on the outside that recognized that. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how he kind of brought it to your attention and then how you started to see it yourself. Yeah, I and we actually talked about this even beforehand, trying to remember the specific thing, like what was it that he even saw? Like, what was it that he saw that was so just like, just illuminated this issue that he suspected existed within our marriage. That was because we were in, um, we were in the apprenticeship program here at Elevation Church. And so we weren't hired yet, but we were kind of in the pipeline, maybe here. we, And, uh, and she was very much a part, like it was me, but she as my wife had availability. And so she was in the classes that we were in and the culture things and everything. Um, and she certainly was not content to like sit back and just be like, Oh, I'm just gonna just allow him to like, yeah. she was very much the way I, I love about her. Like she's a thinker and she's active and she's engaged and she's inquisitive. And like, she was, she's involved in that. Um, so I think back, but I don't remember the specific, I don't know if like, as we were having conversations or as things were happening, we were maybe, unintentionally, intentionally, whatever, trying to get noticed in the class, not as a couple, but as individuals and as getting known by an individual also means getting known above each other. We're not really sure. We don't remember. Um, all we know is that we walked out of one of the classes one of the days and uh, the director of the program at the time, John Bishop, that kind of pulled us aside and said, hey, let me grab you real quick. And he said, I'm sensing this, that y'all don't feel like you're not that you're not on the same team, but you seem like you're, you're competing with one another. Uh, and, and, and maybe not. And he said it very gracefully nice, but I was like, well, and he said it from a place of experience. Like right. I see this in you, what I saw, this is something that right. my wife and I walked through what mm -hmm. he saw with them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I'll say for me, I, it really resonated and mm -hmm. part of it. And I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but you know, like we met in a ministry school. We've always worked for churches. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, our whole identity as a couple is, has really been formed in the context of traditional American evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a whole separate conversation, but for us, there was a time that I really felt stifled and like I was put in a box, like mm -hmm. I'm the pastor's wife and I need to do this, this, and this, and this is how I'm supposed to act. And, and I didn't necessarily feel like in the context of his calling that I actually had a place. Mm -hmm. And so I started to forge, this was again, early days of our marriage, never here at Elevation where, where, where he's on staff now, mm -hmm. but previous places. I felt like I had to forge my own identity separate from his calling because there wasn't room for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, we were talking, like, I don't necessarily know that there was a better way for us to process that, that, you know, that was something it, it, it's formed who we are now. So I wouldn't change it, but it was a very, very painful and long season. Mm -hmm. And I think it created this sense of, okay, well, you're doing your thing. I don't want to be put 
I don't want to be labeled your wife. Mm -hmm. Like I have my own identity. I have my own calling. I have my own strengths, my own giftings that are separate from the pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. And so that for like, for me was really a deep rooted thing that I had to work through. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's taken years for me to figure out how I can do both. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to support him and I want to be his wife and I want to do all the things that I need to do, um, to see him succeed because when he succeeds, we it's, it's us, we're together, we're a team. Mm -hmm. But, um, so anyway, that was, it yeah. just, just gave language to what I had been feeling. Yeah. I think that's, that's it. It, it was language to something that we both, she'd probably been, been feeling and thinking and pondering more. I'm more just, I, I probably don't reflect and think about stuff that's I'm just like, let's move on to the, to the next thing. But mm -hmm. it certainly gave language to why, you know, when I was a youth pastor previously and she would say, hey, I think we should maybe do this instead or whatever. It, we just struggled to work together. And it was like this. And for, for me, it was never feeling like she should be relegated in some, you know, pastor's wife kind of thing. She had, she felt that kind of way from some of her own upbringing and some of those things. Like for me, it was more my own levels of insecurity. That like, it's not, this isn't your ministry. It's that this is entrusted to me and I want to know that I can do it. And I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily need the help of somebody else because I've been called and anointed enough to do this. It's not a downplaying her. It's trying to like feel good enough about myself and the calling that I have. And at 21, you, what do I know about God's will? What do I know about those things? So uh, he definitely spelled it out very, that like those things and those things that help shape and form our perspectives really created a scenario in which uh, a marriage in which we often were not on the same team. Yeah. And, and so let me translate this to an experience for a couple that may not have the pastor, pastor wife scenario, because what you guys are tapping into is, is the identity and, you know, how I feel in the relationship. And a lot of couples struggle with that. There are different scenarios. So let's just consider a few, right? You have a very successful husband, right? And a wife that may not have as much success that feels a little inferior to the success of her husband. It often feels like I'm in his shadow and I don't have a claim to fame. I don't have anything that's my own. I don't have my own gig. I don't have anything that I'm doing. In like manner, you can have a successful wife whose husband may not have as much success on the outside appearance of success as the wife. And so that dynamic is a struggle, right? It's a struggle when you have to figure out how to come together, work together and support each other, but still try to keep my identity within this. And what if my identity isn't as big as your identity, right. but I still got an identity, you know, and I still have things that I want to accomplish and things that I want to do. And I think, and you guys can definitely pipe in here, but I think in those instances, that's when you really have to get to the fundamentals of what love really is, right? Mm -hmm. Because love is about sacrifice. Like if you go and you read the scriptural love, love is not internal facing at all. Lo mm -hmm. Like love is a hundred percent. What are you willing to do and sacrifice for that other person? And the success of either party doesn't change that. But it makes me have to recognize that I have to be available in a certain way for that person that I do love and see what's going on with them. And how can I encourage that? And how can I nurture that so that they don't get lost in it? Because that happens in a lot of relationships and people feel very inferior to the success of their mate. You know, and if you don't have your own thing going or you don't have your own, you know, claim to fame or you don't have your own area where you're making those strong deposits, it could be a little defeating when you're feeling like you're in the shadows. And so within church, like you can call out those roles, but that happens even outside of the church in a lot right. of different relationships. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. So 
I believe that healthy relationships requ require chemistry, right? And you can definitely get a sense of that. There's something that just really draws you into that person and you begin to develop that vested interest in them. Unfortunately, when people hear the word intimacy, they always liken that to what's happening in the bedroom. But true intimacy transcends that. Like true intimacy is I'm looking across the room, we catch eyes and we kind of are on the same page. Like, yeah, they're really crazy over there or whatever the case may be. Like right. you just hit this medium where the two of you are completely in sync and you know what that other person is doing. And that's be, uh, thinking because you're spending time with them and you're learning them in that love process. That connection is something that you have to really earnestly give time and attention to mm. blossom. And it really is something that creates this interdependence. And if you could get to the point where you're willing to truly become interdependent versus remaining independent, then you can really see your intimacy soar. But right. what makes that hard? Like if you think about your experiences, right? What makes it hard to give up that independence bin that we so selfishly have to, to kind of lay that all down so that we can grow interdependently and really develop our intimacy? What do you guys think about that? Uh, well, I mean, I think outside of, some of the things, the whole nature versus nurture thing, some of the things that you're walking into the relationship with, the things you've seen modeled, the things that you've, uh, the habits and the defense mechanisms, coping mechanisms you've been forced to create because of whatever um, is going to make trusting anybody very difficult, let alone to such a deep level that creates a genuine level of intimacy. But I think that for one thing is like to be independent doesn't require me to trust anything but myself. And it's easy for me to trust myself, uh, even though I probably shouldn't trust myself all that much. It's super, super easy for me to trust myself to have a level of interdependence like that dependent part is on there does require me to extend what I give myself so freely to somebody else, believing the best that she could possibly want for me the same level of success and fulfillment that I want for myself and putting a degree of that in her hands. Like mm -hmm. that is that relinquish of control over my own destiny, over my own thing, my own, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. that makes it, I, we're all just, we're all just, you know, <laughs> we are all predisposed to be like super close handed mm -hmm. with our life, with our giftings, with what's been given to us. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't naturally want to allow somebody else into that. I don't want to give somebody else the keys to my car, so to speak. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I want to drive myself. Um, but to your point, like it takes that level of intentionality, <laughs> like, nope, we're going to sit down. We're going to, and it, it doesn't happen by accident. You yeah. have to be able to like, nope, I'm going to in your hand. I'm going to put these in your hands. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust you in this moment to do that. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I can even say like for, for me, something that's made it even additionally more difficult is that I have struggled over the years, partly because of my personality typing, partly because of my upbringing to like fully understand um, and be in touch with my own feelings and my own emotions. And so to give the, the keys over to that room of my own feelings and emotions to somebody else when I don't even really know what's in there. I mean, I don't have time to clean up. I don't have time to sweep up. I don't have time to put something behind a door. I don't know what's in there. Yeah. So without me having a sense of self-awareness, what's in there, it makes it even more difficult to trust somebody at that level because I'm not even in touch with what I'm giving you the keys to. So, mm -hmm. so it's hard. That's huge. That, it's huge. I mean, what, what you just said there is so powerful because in many instances, we got a lot of baggage, right? Mm -hmm. And we come into the relationship with these amped up vulnerabilities and sensitivities. And we don't even really know what's all in there, right? Until sure. you really begin unpacking it. And so what you just described is kind of what causes that hesitancy, 
right? Mm -hmm. Of being open, even with the person who is like the closest to you, you -hmm. know, they are the person, your wife is the person who is going to make the call on your life. Should you be laying on the bed and like need somebody to say what to do? And we're still reluctant as to whether or not we want to be transparent with them. And so that is, absolutely huge what you tapped in into there and sharing what we have to get past to allow ourselves to be all in what do you think Mm -hmm. Adair I mean I we struggle with a lot of similar things which has made it doubly hard because I'm not necessarily naturally very in touch with my feelings either I'm a fixer and I'm an achiever by nature and I have projected that often onto him, you know, where, so even though we've talked a lot about us being on separate teams, there still was this pressure, like you're an extension of me, you have to achieve, you have to. So I think if I'm not, if we aren't being intentional with the time that we're taking with one another and the conversations that we're having, we will talk about work. We will talk about our goals. We will talk about, um, work. I can't even think of another thing because that is just like our, our normal mode is, is that. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I think taking the time whenever I don't do that on my own and he doesn't do that on his own to even figure out what do I feel about this? What am I carrying with me after the day is done? You know, why am I a little bit snappy at the kids? I haven't even processed that. I'm still holding on to something that my coworker said to me. And like, I don't take the time to figure out how I'm doing. And and so, but that's so, and I think it just comes with time and growing and maturing as a person and in a marriage. Mm -hmm. Like I, I literally have to figure out how I'm doing and what's, why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling so that I can communicate that to him so that he can support me if I need to be supported Mm -hmm. or, if I need to take a break, he can let me go and take a break or whatever it is. If I'm not taking the time to like figure out how I'm feeling, Mm -hmm. well, he can't help me. And he can't, I mean, it it is, it's the, it's the essence of vulnerability, like Mm -hmm. sharing that piece, those, those pieces of yourself with the person that has to have your back. Yeah. And then when you layer on, I've been hurt before, Uh, you've hurt me before, (laughs) you know, you layer on all of those different scenarios on top of that, right? You, you have to challenge yourself to get past all of that so that I can try to be open enough to share what's going on. And God forbid it happens at the wrong moment, right? right? Because timing is everything when it comes to being willing to be available and also being willing to share. Because if I'm coming in and I have mustered up the courage to be sensitive and really tell you what I think, and you are tired and you are spent you are not going to meet my courage to be vulnerable with the right sensitivity. And then it can go all wrong and talk about hesitation to try again. It's like, I'm not even going to talk to you about that because that went, that conversation went completely to the side. And so there are so many things, so many factors that have to come into play when you're working on growing together Mm -hmm. and learning one another and, you know, having a sense like Adair talked about to, "Mm, she's not in a good mood. So it's probably not the best time to tell her I went out and spent X, right. You know, because because that's not going to go over well right now. She's not going to follow. <laughs> she's not going to follow my logic. She's not going to follow what I see on the other side of all of this. And so, I, how, how did that become a factor for you guys? Learning timing. Well, I will say that I think the biggest game changer for us is that we just made it a consistent habit to check in with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I don't think that there is like a right way to figure out and there's, it's not formulaic, you know, like, I don't know that every single day at seven 30 after we've had dinner and the kitchen's clean, that that's always like the right time. Mm-hmm. So I think 
Um, and I don't know that we ever even like went out or started trying to learn this about each other. I just think that over time, if we, as the ultimate value has really become, we want to be on the same page with each other. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's more important than me being mm -hmm. right or you right. being right. Like we have to come to a place where we're together. Like we can, we can have each other's back and it feels good to be mad sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it feels like really good to nurse a resentment or to nurse an offense. And for me as a, as a woman, I think that was the biggest and still is one of the hardest things. Like I have to consciously, especially when we've already gotten into it over something or he's, you know, ticked me off and maybe doesn't even know it. Mm -hmm. It would be very easy for me to just give him the silent treatment for a couple hours until he feels like something's off. But I think I've gotten a lot better at like, I don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. Our boys deserve better than that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to swallow my need to be right or my, or how good it feels just to be angry mm -hmm. <laughs> and let him know. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I always get the timing thing. Mm -hmm. super right but I also know he I have a very gracious husband and his temperament he is so motivated to make things right mm -hmm. sometimes faster than I'm even ready to I'm mm -hmm. like well let's like authentically come to a solution <laughs> hate over it um so I feel like you're always pretty receptive whenever I I have something to say mm -hmm. you know, I think Cause I think to your point, like timing, there's, there's a responsibility of the one who feels the level of grievance or feels the level of courage or muster to, to, to figure out the timing of the other, like, is this the right time for them? Like they have that, but there's also the responsibility of the other person that if somebody is coming and maybe you're not there yet to recognize and understand the sacrifice of love being made by the other person to be like, you know what, they are really going out on a limb. They're trying to do something real intimate. They're trying to, I probably should have approached this conversation earlier, but they're ready now. I'm not quite, but I'm going to go ahead and shift gears internally to sit down, to be ready for it. That's why it's like, I think some of the best marriage advice we ever got was that marriage is not 50, 50, it's a hundred, a hundred. Like you both have got to bring all of it all the time. That way, if I'm not completely there yet, your hundred percent makes up for my 20% and mm -hmm. my seven, my hundred percent makes up for your 30. So um, cause ultimately we got, we got to get to the end, but I think for, for me, it really has been, and to her point, we, we probably should have done more like research and interpersonal studying on like, what is, what is the best time for you after this? Should I, should I rub your feet? And then maybe sometime in that process on like the third <laughs> toe, we can talk like, we haven't really done that. I think, um, probably in a, you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when we started making the decision to have weekly date nights, I do think though, she said, it's not a, it can't be a routine. Like we don't know. Cause I'm really, our lives are so all over the place. Like, even if we wanted to say, Hey, Thursdays after lunch, it would like, it's all so different all the time. So it's hard to pinpoint, but making some intentional time every single week, um, whether we felt like it or not, whether we felt like we had the money for it or not, like whatever, like we are going to go on the state and we're going to do that started creating, like we had to be disciplined first, just like with love. A lot of times you got to do it, whether you feel it or not. And eventually what you do as an action starts to produce those feelings of love that, you know, you, you were hoping for in the first place. So you can't feel your way into love. You've got to really act your way into those feelings of love that you're looking for. So for me, I really think there's a responsibility on both sides with the timing thing. That's I, I need to be ready to go and do it. I need to be aware when it makes sense, but I also need to be willing to shift gears if they're ready and I'm not, because ultimately this is a, this is a moment of reconciliation and a moment of intimacy that if she comes to me. I want to, I legitimately want to like, this is a special moment. Like it took her a while to get this. I want to be able to shift if I need to kids, please shut up for a minute. Go over there. Let's have this conversation. Yeah. And, and what's, imp what's important even beyond just the recognition of honoring her effort. Um, if you say scat cat, somebody else is saying kitty kitty. You know what I mean by that? Like if you saying go away, there's somebody else who's saying, come to me, which means that protecting your relationship 
means that I have to be available for you. And if that means I've got to get past myself, because I don't want you to ever feel like it's not me you need to come to, that I want to be the safe place for you. And so if that means I need to swallow my pride and kind of get over it a little bit quickly because you're ready, then let me swallow my pride and get over it a little bit quickly because I don't want to open the door to the enemy in any kind of way, Right. right? And in those moments where I feel like you've brushed me off, In those moments where I feel like you haven't given me proper attention, those are the moments that get exploited by the enemy and cause something to happen and as a rift in relationships that can tear it apart. And so you want to make sure, to your point, Matt, that you are open to the dialogue when you're like, well, she's ready. I ain't all the way there yet, but let me, let me get myself there. Right. right? right. Let me get myself, you know, to the point where I can be receptive to what's being shared in this moment, because I don't want her to ever feel like it's not me. She needs to run to. It's not me that she needs to come to because I, always want to be that place. I always want to make sure that my arms are the safest place where my husband finds comfort and finds attention. And so I think it's, it's important that you seal, you, you seal that shut so that nobody else is saying, well, come on over here because that's the reality. And that's how, unfortunately, you know, chaos can enter a relationship and really dilute and disrupt a marriage is when we're not being, you know, really available to share in those moments where reconciliation has to be the goal. So we, we you talked about this a little bit because I know it impacts us. I, I came into the relationship with a lot of baggage, right? And there's things that Like I have to push myself all the time, you know, reminding me myself what the word of God says about me because I fight self-esteem. I fight that self-esteem battle all of the time. How do you think how you were raised and how you grew up, how does that impact your ability to truly get on the same page? Now, I don't want you to just like expose all the family business. We can talk more conceptually as you're comfortable in how it impacts, but I think it's a huge factor. Yeah. Mm. You wanna go first? You go. Well, I will say that, and I think we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, but the role I played, not just with my family, but even in friendships. And I, so I don't know if it was a personality thing, a nurture thing, a little bit of both. Firstborn thing. I'm a firstborn. Um, I was just always good. Like I just didn't need a whole lot of extra attention. I didn't need a whole lot of extra pats on the back. Um, but what I did, what the message that I internalized, not necessarily that this is the message that was actually said to me, but it's the message I heard (laughs) what, regardless of what was being actually spoken was that if whatever I produce the achievements that I make, that that is what makes me valuable Mm. to my family Mm. or to my friends. And I for sure brought that into our marriage. And so when I was in a season where I was kind of relegated and I, and that's a, that's a harsh term, but that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really knocked me back and down a peg or two, as far as my self-esteem goes, because I felt like what I brought to the table wasn't valued at all anymore Mm -hmm. and not by him, by people around us, but it impacted our marriage because we were newly, we were newlyweds. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's just been in probably the last four or five years that I've really started to do the work of like it's not what I produce. It's not, it's not my achievements. I mean, those are bonuses and, and I, and I, I am an achiever and I'm not, that's who I am, Mm -hmm. but like me bring my, bringing my authentic self to him. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what he wants. Mm -hmm. And I've even learned that my friends, they don't really care like my, how I did at work. They just want me to be their friend. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like a paradigm shift for me. And it's still something that, um, 
the vulnerability thing, you know, and, and even I remember again, early on and, and even until the last couple of years having to remind him, like, I know that I seem like I'm good, but I'm actually like not good. Like I'm actually drowning, but I, I can't let you know I'm drowning. Like I can never act like I'm drowning, but I really am drowning. So can you check in on me? Can you like, can you take care of me? And and I remember a conversation we had, it was one of our first apartments we lived in. And I remember telling him like, or, or I think you had said to me, you just always seem like you're fine. Mm -hmm. And that's because I always act like I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And um, so learning how, but it, again, that's on me to like tap into. Mm -hmm. I don't really like to feel negative feelings. I'm a fixer. I'm an optimist. I like to have fun. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I have to build that into my like daily personal refre reflection and like time with God to like figure out the deeper parts of who I am so that I can bring that to the table. I don't know. What do you think? Yours is a lot more probably profound than what, <laughs> what, what I would say. I mean, I, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm a twin. Um, and I, I I've got in great family and great all that, but as a, as a twin with a whole big giant Irish family that lived around with a bunch of uncles and everything, uh, one kind of like my wife, a lot of things just came easily to me. So I, I was kind of good a lot of times, but add on to that, uh, a twin brother that was also good at things, good at sports, good at whatever. And a bunch of uncles that would egg us on and make us compete against each other. And we shared the same group of friends and we were constantly having to vibe for like, are you my friend or are you his friend? Or what, what, what is those things? So it lived in like a constant state of, you know, competition and even like the we we for no we, we would get called up at like football banquets you know they do at the end of the year for rocket peewee football or whatever and they're like they give the trophies to everybody and we get called up uh uh the the mcandrew boys mm -hmm. or the twins or whatever and so it's like we weren't our own people mm -hmm. and so we dealt with this level like all the time of we're like just grouped together as one thing where, which built in me a rather significant sense of like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. like I am separate. I'm independent. I am 100% not my brother. <laughs> like, so, and I mean, cause even before that, as, as a little kid, I remember very clearly being known as I was a little more shy or whatever, known as my brother's name is Hayden, known as Hayden's brother. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to, that's not going to happen. Like I'm not, I'm not. I, so I got to build my own sense of identity. So so it's like I had 18 years of, of that kind of foundation. And, and even with my parents, like they, they didn't mean at all, like any level of like, you know, we prefer one over the other, but you know, my brother struggled probably a little bit more with school and some behavioral things early on. And so like some of their energy had to go to handling that. And so I was forced to kind of be like, well, I'm, I'm good. Like I'll, I'll make A's and do all this thing, whatever. And so like all those things put together made me somebody who is going to be successful and was going to be an achiever and was going to compete in anything that I did. But that also means that I was going to compete with the person that I wound up with. It wasn't just going to turn off. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it definitely became something that itself was a, a, a huge obstacle to compete with in our, in our marriage. So we definitely brought our, our childhoods and our own perceptions of our childhood um, and what we did with those into our marriage, a hundred percent. So we're, and it took years. I mean, I think I remember it was like a year and a half ago, we were on our, one of our, maybe once a year, twice a year, we're able to get away just the two of us. So we always try to do, do a trip somewhere. And we had like a therapy session on the way to Orlando or something or New Orleans or something. And she's like digging up. I remember like starting to like make a, make a joke about something because it was getting so deep. <laughs> it was getting like, yeah. I, I can't, I can't touch all that. I don't, I don't know. I gotta, it's, it's like hitting a funny bone. It hurts, but it makes you laugh, but I don't want to. So it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. It, it impacts more than we think, right? Because it impacts our behavior. What's really interesting to me though, is earlier, I, I think it becomes so innate as a part of who you are that you don't really recognize when it's starting to reveal itself until someone calls it out to you. Um, right. Because when, 
when John, I think was his name, mentioned it, you're like, I don't see it, but it probably is such a pattern of who you are because you've done it literally all your life to mm-hmm. kind of separate and define yourself. Um, and so I could imagine how that was a, a part of impacting your ability ability to uh become interconnected and interdependent because you worked really hard (laughs) at trying to disassociate yourself um, growing up. And so I think that that's huge, but we all have those experiences, right? Growing up that we bring into the relationship. And I think what you guys tapped into, at least on your trip is talking about it and Mm -hmm. it does go deep, you know? Um, and sometimes it goes deeper than you're like, I'm not ready to go that deep today. Like we went deep enough. Three feet is all we need to go today. Um, it like, uh, I should thought like I, one time ever I had this where I had, um, a, a deep tissue massage mm-hmm. where it's like, they, they just, and it's like so deep. It takes you by surprise. It hits nerves and endings that you didn't know were there. And it's like, Oh, that's like, it's, it's good. I know this is good, but it's unbelievably painful. <laughs> like, I don't know what to think about this in this moment. Mm-hmm. So think of it. Yeah, I could definitely see that. So what are some specific things that you do to kind of stay on the same page, right? To, to keep yourself in motion. I think date night is absolutely a great idea um, in trying to be intentional about the time. But what about some of the other things you guys have tried or that you do? Well, I went to therapy. Mm -hmm. So that is, um, for me, probably been one of the most helpful and transformative things in helping me like figure out even what it is I believe about myself Mm -hmm. that is not helpful anymore. It might've been helpful at one point, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, honestly, through that and through just different areas of interest that I've developed over the years, Mm -hmm. it has helped me know how to ask questions better and be more curious, Mm -hmm. um, which I think has helped us have more meaningful conversations Mm -hmm. where we go below work, below kids, um, below whatever's frustrating us from the day and like actually get to some, like the meat of our, of our identity. You know, you talked about identity at the very beginning. And I think that, you know, our identity, first of all, I think we might not even know what our identity is. That's like a journey that we're all on as individuals. So that's one thing, but it's a whole nother thing to share that identity with the person that you're with and figure out how you relate to one another. And then as life goes on, like your identity shifts naturally, you know, Mm -hmm. as you become a parent or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, or as you let go of some identity, maybe you need to shed that, you, you know, isn't working for you anymore. And So, um, therapy and just like Mm self-awareness and whatever that looks like podcasts and books and, Mm -hmm. you know, meditation and prayer. Mm -hmm. Um, we also on our date nights, we, so those are like non-negotiable anymore. And for seven years, we didn't really date. We would date whenever family was in town and we had free childcare, but we, um, we just decided two years ago that we were going to make the financial investment to budget for childcare so that we could go on dates Mm -hmm. and, um, and like have very, very, uh, clear, sometimes hard and difficult. And it was hard for people to understand why, like, no, 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 I'm I'm not, I'm not working. I'm not doing that at that point. Mm -hmm. Thursday night, it is our date night. It will work. Like we had to be dogmatic about it for a season because for seven years it was like, well, it'll happen when it happens. But again, dating doesn't happen when you, like me and you just don't spend money naturally because mm-hmm. you're like, Hey, we can just save money and not do this. And, and then it's work and it's like, yeah. so it's, it's a lot. So we had to be very intentional about it for a long time. But we, and also the types of dates that we go on, we don't go see movies. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we always go to dinner, mm-hmm. but we try to find stuff that will might be trying something new that would bring up, you know, to make a new funny memory or, most of the time we just find like a patio to go hang out on and we might play board games or we've tried doing like a couple's journal before, which we've never successfully followed through on. (laughs) But the biggest thing we do that we always do, we have a couple's check-in and it was actually my counselor that 
gave it to me because she recognized that I struggle with vulnerability. He struggles with vulnerability. And this, there's these four questions that, man, it is crazy how you'll find yourself not even getting through all four questions because it just really, they're always, they're always helpful. There's mm. always something fresh that's yeah. going to be brought up. The first question is, um, what's something that your partner did that you really appreciated mm -hmm. from the week? Mm -hmm. um, what is an area that you feel like you missed it as a partner mm -hmm. that you need to apologize for or rectify? Um, what is a feeling that you've felt personally from the week? Mm -hmm. And what is a need that you have mm -hmm. that your partner might be able to help with? Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy because, well, the need the, the last question, what's the need that you have? That's the thing that we're not very good at identifying for ourselves, mm -hmm. but it has been honestly transformative. Um, and sometimes it is, we need to have sex. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it is that simple, but other times it is. I just need you to like, whenever I'm, I'm going through this thing at work and I know that you feel like you have all these ideas that you can help me fix it, but I really just need to like vomit, word vomit all over you. And then I can just forget about it and not talk about it tonight, you know? I so. do. Those are awesome. You know, that was a free tip for anybody listening. Those four questions sound like amazing questions to ask. Um, and I love the whole word vomit because sometimes I'm, I know even in our relationship, I'll have to stop and say, I'm not looking for you to solve anything, you right. know, <laughs> like I'm, I'm just saying what I want to say. I'm not looking for you to come up with a game plan for me. Right. And so I think just kind of being clear with some of those expectations kind of freeze. Cause then he's like, Oh, okay. You know, he's kind of like, okay, I could just listen. And so I think being able to be expressive is really cool. It's so interesting. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's so interesting. I literally just uh, probably an hour ago was listening to a podcast, um, Craig Rochelle's leadership podcast, and it was about problem solving. And he said, as a, as a leader, your value lies in your ability to solve problems. And so, but that speaks so directly in the opposite of the idea. Like sometimes you just, your value is in not solving the problem. <laughs> it's in just listening. So I'm like, it's just so funny the way, you know, it's, it's both and okay. It is. It is. Cause even as a leader, sometimes people just want to be able to express and um, have a chance to just give you perspective. Yeah. You know, I, I really appreciate you guys sharing with us tonight. Um, Cause it's, it's like I said at the beginning, it's not like you arrive on this, like Chuck and I are approaching 27 years and we're still working really hard at it. You know, um, like you, you talked about where did I go wrong? Well, I could tell you Saturday I went wrong. He called me and he was just checking in and my daughter and I were trying to figure out my stupid iPad and I was all frustrated and I gave him nothing but attitude on the phone when he called, <laughs> you know, so nobody ever arrives, you know, so that was my mark to answer one of your <laughs> questions like, where, what I I do? <laughs> where I felt like I just had this complete stumble. And then later I'm texting, right. Then you're trying to, I'm texting like, sorry, we were, I was frustrated, you know, um, it's something that you have to work at, you know, relationships, you get the good and then you get the raw, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the key is just being willing to give grace and being right. willing to stick with it and mm -hmm. always go back to the reasons why you love that person and want it to be committed to them and allow that to shine right? A allow that to shine as your focus that you can kind of stay fixed on so that you don't get distracted and pulled away. Well, here we, we uh, are working to build a life that we love without apology. And so I love to always ask these closeout questions. Uh, the first one is about life wisdom and what life wisdom would you tell your younger self if you could? So Matt, what would you tell your younger self about life uh, wisdom that you now know if you could? Um, specific to my life, I am on the, uh, on the Enneagram, I'm an eight, so I'm a challenger. So by nature, I just challenge everything, ideas, even things that I just 
I, I may actually even agree with you, but just for the sake of playing devil's advocate, just argue things just for the sake, just for the sake of doing it. Um, and I would tell myself, Hey man, like not everything you need to argue about every little thing, just like relax, like mm-hmm. enjoy your life. Your relationships will be better. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Adair? What's your life wisdom for your younger self? Um, I would say that you can bring your full self. You don't have to tone it down all the time. And I think I've just started my, I just, I'm 31. Mm-hmm. And in my 30th year, I just started to really like kind of not care as much about what some people might think about this or that, not to a fault. You know, I feel like everybody needs to be accountable for their actions, obviously, but Um, but with that also being willing to like, listen, to understand, and then, you know, be willing to let your opinions change as you get new information. Um, that is something that I've learned the value of in the last couple of years. Mm. Awesome. Very, very cool. All right. Love wisdom. What love wisdom would you tell your younger self? If you could, I'll start with you, Adair. Um, extend the benefit of the doubt every time. Mm-hmm. Just, just believe the best. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, we, like my wife said, we got unexpectedly pregnant. Like, and we talked about like never having kids. We're like, maybe we'll do the Christian thing and adopt one day. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got pregnant like five months in. So we had very limited time, like together as like a married couple. Mm-hmm. And then we mo- immediately, as soon as we had the, our child, like we moved like a month before we had our first child, we moved five hours away from the nearest family. We didn't know anybody. And it was our first full-time job. I mean, it just, it was a lot. And we really allowed kids and work and all those things and stress and exhaustion, all those things to really prevent us. And we talked about intimacy is not just physical, but it's this, but we allowed it to prevent a lot of just normal physical intimacy and those things. So I'm like, Hey, tell my younger self, dude, for the love of God, like do not allow your kids, do not allow work. Don't allow anything to prevent you from being able to be physically intimate with your wife, because that was created as something for you guys. It does something for you internally. It draws you closer. That's why intimacy is so often associated with the physicality because it does draw you closer. Um, and there's a long time that we, we just did not, we were tired. We were so tired and so exhausted. And I'm just like, make it a priority. It's helpful for you, for your communication, for everything. That's beautiful. I love that one. Check. I'll do that one. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then finally, what's your happiness wisdom? What would you tell your younger self about happiness? If you could, I'll start with the dare again. Happiness. This is, I I struggle with, with this kind of thing. Um, I would tell my younger self, that my happiness isn't tied to other people being happy with me. Mm. That's what I would say. Cause that, that robbed me of a whole lot of happiness when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Still does. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is super good and very specific to your personality and your own personal struggle and wiring. That's very good. (laughs) We need to write that down and put it somewhere. I will write it down after this. (laughs) Um, you know, like, it just came out. That's, 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 um, I, I think for me, and it really just kind of a bookend to what I talked about in the beginning, um, because of my personality and the desire to achieve and be beneficial and make a difference in all those things, I just so valued, overvalued work and valued my personal and, and all those things. And really, when I look back, across the 10 years, there are some great things I've been able to be a part of, but the things that truly sit the deepest in my heart and that I smile the widest about and and I'm most proud of are just the incredible moments with my wife and with my kids and my, there just is nothing more that brings me more genuine, deep level happiness and, and godly joy than being able to revel in those moments with my family. So, uh, keep your priorities straight, man. (laughs) Like your family is the most important and will ultimately bring you the most happiness if you're invested well. 
That's awesome. You know, I want you to know that there are a couple of things that have resonated throughout Couples Love Week so far, and that is one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's been very powerful to hear uh, the husbands who have been on share that very point. Mm -hmm. It, it, It really has been consistent for the nights that we've had that every last one of them are invested in family and recognize the need with their own genuine desire to be there for their family and what value it means to them. So I am glad to hear that, you know, because one of the things that started me on this whole course of action with everything I've been working on is trying to keep families together and stir that very point. And so it does my heart good to really, really hear uh, husbands who are invested in their families. And I love that. The second thing that we heard loud and clear across each of the nights is actually therapy. And I love the fact that we're removing stigmas about it and really recognizing the power of the conversations, the freedom that comes from them. And just because I go to therapy doesn't mean that I am crazy. It means that I am wise and I am seeking help to get where I need to go to advance my thoughts in my mind so that it can be as powerful as I need it to be. And so I love the fact that those two things have resonated so strongly. And even more, I love the fact that you guys are here. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead, Uh, Matt. I was just gonna say, and gentlemen, just a heads up, uh, she has done therapy, I'm on deck. Uh, We've just actually finished a round for my uh, therapy for my oldest son just play therapy and stuff for it is we're stuff. we're round robin we're therapy. round robin we can't afford all at the same time but <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're making we're making our rounds oh that's awesome well i love to close out by saying this one thing and it's the authentic truth success looks so good on you guys thank you so much for being a part of couples love week and i love you guys immensely Have a good evening. Thank you, Denise. All right. Well, that's it, beautiful. Thank you for tuning in. Don't ever forget that you truly deserve life, love, and all the happiness your heart can hold. Be relentless in building a life you love without apology. I'm Denise Taylor, and you can always find me in our free Facebook community. Life, love, in the pursuit of happiness, easy to find. Now, if you want more information about my success superpowers, as I'm sure you do, download my free success superpowers ebook at denisetaylor.live forward slash podcast. And one last thing, always embrace your power and go.